fallout over the Colorado Supreme Court decision to bar President Trump from the ballot continues to rock the nation. Conservative commentators like Tucker Carlson were quick to decry the move as the end of democracy. Here's a little bit of Carlson's monologue from yesterday's show. Take a listen. Despite the fact Donald Trump has never been convicted by any court of insurrection, and although the 14th Amendment specifically does not apply to the presidency, Donald Trump cannot run for president because he's an insurrectionist. This seemed like lunacy because it was lunacy. 3,000 miles away in El Salvador, there was no question about what was happening. The United States has lost its ability to lecture any other country about, quote, democracy, wrote Salvadoran President Nayib Bukele. And yet in this country, no one on the left dared say that. Instead, Donald Trump's enemies celebrated. The Atlantic Magazine expressed gratitude that unelected judges had, quote, rescued the country from the desires of voters, because actually that's democracy. Conservatives seemingly have good reason to fear this could become a trend as following Colorado's move to oust Trump from the ballot, 16 more states filed lawsuits to do the same. Michigan, Oregon, New Jersey, Wisconsin, Alaska, Arizona, Nevada, and New York are just a few states where lawsuits to remove Trump's name from the ballot have made their way to the courts. The country is split on Colorado's decision, as The Hill reports. More than half of Americans do approve of the Colorado Supreme Court ruling to bar former President Trump from the state's primary ballot, according to a YouGov poll. Meanwhile, Trump and his legal team are urging the Supreme Court to deny special counsel Jack Smith's request to consider Trump's claims of presidential immunity from criminal prosecution. The court is currently considering a request from Smith to bypass the D.C. Circuit Court and decide whether Trump is fully shielded from criminal prosecution surrounding his conduct on January 6th and beyond. Here to discuss the legal ramifications and what happens next for the Trump team is lawyer and legal expert Professor Alan, Alan Dershowitz. Welcome back to the show. Thank you. Professor Dershowitz, I want to take on uh, some of the bigger legal questions with respect to the Colorado case first. Uh, As we mentioned in the read, and I think as Tucker Carlson just alluded to, one of the components um, uh, of this lawsuit that are being questioned is whether or not it applies to the president of the United States, the section of the 14th Amendment. Many legal uh, uh, commentators that I've listened to say that that is the weakest part of Trump's objection. What do you make of that? Well, it's it's a technical objection because the term that's used in the 14th Amendment is support. And that's not in the presidential oath. Presidential oath says preserve, protect and defend. It's a highly technical argument. The much, much stronger argument is Section 5 of the 14th Amendment, which is as clear as could be. It says the Congress shall have the power to enforce by appropriate legislation the provisions of this article. In other words, it's Congress, not the states. And that makes so much sense. When you think of how the 14th Amendment was passed, it was passed by radical Republican Lincoln uh, 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 Reconstructionists. And the last thing they would want is to let states make that decision, because the states include Mississippi, Alabama, uh, you know, all the Confederate states. So it would have been lunacy for the framers to allow the states, state courts, like the Colorado Supreme Court, to decide what is an insurrection and whether it applies to the president or not. This is a decision that's allocated by the Constitution solely to Congress, and it's a power grab by the Colorado Supreme Court. Now, I'm shocked that constitutional lawyers like Lawrence Tribe and Jamie Raskin and uh, Judge Michael Lutek never quote this Article 5, Congress shall have the power to enforce it means what it says. It means that the states have no business interfering in a federal election. So I, I want to ask you two questions. Um, one being, I, I'm seeing uh, you brought up the insurrection term. I've seen some uh, people, in, including, I should say, some liberals and some Democrats. It's, it's there. There are people who want Trump not to be president again, who have recognized some weaknesses in this ruling. Um, the term insurrection, which is used in Section Three, whether that, e- even if one thinks Trump has committed some crime or had tried to remain in office beyond legal means, whether that's the same thing as the kind of violently overthrowing or occupying or forming a breakaway state the way the Confederates did, the term insurrection implies. Um, And I'll let you address that first, and then I've got another question. 
course, insurrection doesn't apply to demonstrations or other kinds of even riots that have gone bad. <clears throat> An insurrection has a particular and precise meaning. You know, we've had insurrections in this country uh, early in our history. Um, we've had some insurrections uh, before the Civil War, but they were attempts to take over the government. Aaron Burr uh, put up an army to try to, uh, uh, from, from Louisiana, that may have been an insurrection. But this is no more of an insurrection than Black Lives Matter or what's going on in New York now where these Hitler youth are marching and calling for the overthrow of the United States government because they support Israel. Um, one man's insurrection is another man's protest. And the big issue is who gets to decide what an insurrection is. And the 14th Amendment is clear. The courts don't. Certainly not the state courts. Certainly not the Colorado court. It's up to Congress to define what an insurrection is, and it hasn't done it. It hasn't gone a step further and said, well, an insurrection requires these elements, but they haven't done it. And so it, it can't be enforced. You can't uh, remove somebody from the ballot. If the Trump were, of, just, just one quick thing, if Trump were convicted of one, in one of the four, you know, four indictment prosecutions he's facing, um, I've seen some commentator, commentators say they think that would make the legal argument for what Colorado has done stronger. Um, do you agree with that? I do not agree with that. I think the issue is one of jurisdiction. Um, and uh, of course he could be convicted of insurrection. If he's indicted in the District of Columbia, they'll indict and convict a ham sandwich if his name Trump is on it. You know, 95% of the voters of the DC um, hate Donald Trump. And so it would be very easy to get a conviction. So I think it's a big mistake for Trump supporters to focus on the lack of a conviction. By the way, I am not a Trump supporter. I want to see Trump defeated fairly. I want to see him on the ballot. I want to have the right to vote against him, and people should have the right to vote for him. But I don't want an unfair election, even though I would welcome a result of Trump being beaten. I don't want him to be beaten unfairly. Addressing the comparison between the January 6th uh insurrection and the protests that have happened around the country, whether during Black Lives Matter or currently at the Capitol, where uh, Jewish Voices for Peace and another a number of other groups largely led um, by uh, Jewish Americans who are protesting the 20,000 Palestinians that have been killed in the last two months and are calling for a ceasefire. You know, the, the question is not whether or not the actual events at the Capitol on January 6th are the insurrection. The question is whether or not the weeks-long um, alleged fraud attempt to submit a fake state of electors that these Republicans that were involved in the scheme knew were fake and not, did not reflect the electoral will of the people in seven states across the country, hopeful that there was enough ambiguity for Mike Pence to be able to say, let's throw this to the House, which would then vote, because of the numbers of um, the representatives in the House, would end up being able to throw the, the election to Donald Trump, despite what the uh, yeah. will of the people in those states were. That is a different scheme, right? And do you think that focusing on that I, scheme, as opposed to just the riot on January 6th, is credibly a, 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 an insurrection or the same kind of desire to undemocratically throw over, overturn the government that you describe in the Civil War context or in some of those other historical contexts you alluded to? Absolutely not. Um, an insurrection requires violence. By the way, I want to comment a little bit on Jewish Voice for Peace and Jews. Jewish Voice for Peace is not a Jewish organization. It's a fraud. They're mostly non-Jews. They're radical revolutionaries. And they use the word Jewish, but they're not Jewish. And the same thing is maybe 1% of Jews uh, support Hamas, but they're vocal and they use the word Jew when they go and they protest. But don't be fooled. A Jewish Voice for Peace is not Jewish. It has no voice, and it doesn't favor peace. But well, I think an insurrection requires violence. What you're describing is a legal tactic. Maybe it's illegal, and maybe the lawyers should be punished for it. But it's not an insurrection. An insurrection does not involve making uh, legal arguments, even if they're frivolous legal arguments. So, for one, I have interviewed leadership at Jewish Voice for Peace, both 
Jewish. Um, one woman's father uh, is a, a, a religious figure, a rabbi, I believe. Uh, I have spoken to many members of Jewish Voice for Peace who are themselves Jewish. And I would agree with you that most Jewish people, of course, don't support Hamas, but neither does Jewish Voice for Peace, which is very specifically advancing a demand for a ceasefire after 20,000, no, no, again, no. civilians no, have been killed in, in Gaza. Jewish Go ahead. Peace. Jewish Voice for Peace started to condemn Israel and blame Israel for the rapes and murders before Israel fired a single shot. On October 8th, it's in my book, I wrote a book called War Against the Jews, I document Jewish Voice for Peace. It started blaming Israel for the rapes, the murders, and the beheadings on October 8th. The ceasefire is just something that they've come to lately in order to increase their power. They are pro-Hamas. There's absolutely no doubt about that. Ask the Anti-Defamation League. It's an anti-Semitic organization with the name Jewish. And when they interview you, they send their four or five front people who are Jews to persuade you that it's a Jewish organization. But it's not. It's a fraudulent organization. Well, let me ask you about this. There has been an, not an attempt, but a, a successful effort to, at a congressional level, conflate anti-Semitism with anti-Zionism the way that it seems like you're doing now, since Jewish Voice for Peace, very specifically, when you talk about condemnations of Israel, more specifically what they did uh, following the horrific attacks on October 7th, was to point out that there's been an ongoing occupation of Gaza, that the people who live in Gaza are largely those who were forced out of their homes during the 1948 Nakba, or the descendants of those people, and that to have real peace in the region, you have to have self-determination for that group of people who cannot continue to live in conditions that humanitarian groups have described as an open-air prison. Is that Are you saying that you think it's appropriate to con conflate that kind of a criticism with anti-Semitism itself in the way that Congress has done, which many people on the right and the left have criticized as a an abridgment of the free speech rights of Americans to associate freely and to criticize you're, a foreign government. You're, you're you're testifying now, so please let me speak and make my point. Absolutely. Uh, I don't Zionism with anti-Zionism. I do equate support for Hamas with anti-Semitism. Jewish Voice for Peace supports Hamas. They praise Hamas. They think the rapes and the murders were good. Things. They. Uh, and, and the National Lawyers Guild praised Hamas, and 33 Jewish groups at Harvard, I'm sorry, uh, uh, groups at Harvard praised Hamas. Praising Hamas is, is anti-Semitic uh, criticism. Can you, can you provide a citation, uh, Professor Dershowitz, for, for that proposition that Jewish Voice for Peace praised Hamas? You're dominating this conversation. You're going to let me finish. I am in favor of a two-state solution. I have been critical of Israel. I am a Zionist. I don't believe that uh, uh, anti-Zionism is necessarily equatable to anti-Semitism, but it often is when you combine it with pro-Hamas sentiments and support for butchery and murder, yes, then it becomes anti-Semitism. I, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I would like to ask well, you if you did. have a... I apologize for that, Professor Dershowitz, so perhaps you could provide a citation for the proposition that Jewish Voice for Peace praised Hamas in your words. That's a very specific allegation for a Jewish group that I am very familiar with, have interviewed with at length, and have never seen Read any evidence of the like. book is in my book, and the, the quotations and the, the, the statements that were made and the signs that were held up at Jewish, Voice, Jewish for Peace demonstrations have praised Hamas, have supported Hamas, and they're fooling you. They're sending you the six Jews in the organization to fool you. They're not sending you the hundreds of radical socialist non-Jews who formed this revolutionary group that really, in the end, wants to overthrow the government of the United States. And they were very clever. They used Jewish Voice for Peace to pretend that Jews somehow support Hamas, and they, and they don't. So, Professor, Professor Dershowitz, are, is your contention that you have a book and a citation in front of you, but you're unable to give an example of Jewish Voice for Peace actually condemning Hamas? I, no, I've seen it. I'm, I'm, I'm condemning Hamas? No, they never condemned Hamas. I'm sorry, appraising uh, Hamas? Defending Hamas? Praising Hamas, in your words? With my own eyes, I've seen signs that Jewish Voice for Peace demonstrations Palestine will be free from the river to the sea. I see. Clean, clean Palestine of dirty Jews. Yes, they support Hamas. And, oh, and oh, okay. You, so do you, you have evidence, you've seen a sign of a Jewish Voice for Peace member holding a sign that says, clean Palestine of dirty Jews? That's a pretty remarkable 
sign yeah, that I feel yeah. like would have gone quite viral if someone had some evidence of that. Say clean. Clean is a Nazi term that was used in the 1930s and 40s to refer to dirty Jews. Palestine will be free from the river to Wait, the so, sea. so you're saying you did not see a sign that said clean Palestine of dirty Jews. You're, you're saying that you saw a sign not, with the word clean and you're reading into that? Of course I'm reading into it, wouldn't you? I see. I see. You know, Earlier, you, go ahead, I'm sorry. Somebody uh, talked about uh, get rid of the unclean African-Americans. Wouldn't you read something into that? Of course you would well, read something into that. Well, if a sign that. said get rid of the unclean African-Americans, I absolutely would. But you just said that you did not see a sign that said... Uh, clean Palestine of the dirty Jews, you're editorializing from a sign that I don't know what it said, but use the word clean. The word dirty Jews. I said, I saw signs that said clean Palestine or clean the world. They're all over the place. You see them in almost every demonstration in Europe and in New York and all over the country. And Palestine will be free from the river to the sea has been deemed to be calling for the end of Israel, calling for the Hamas charter to be satisfied. No two-state solution. Have you seen, I have a question for you. Have you seen a single sign, a single sign at any demonstration calling for a single state solution? I will give you $100 for your favorite charity if you can find me a single sign at any demonstration that supports a two-state solution, which I support. Oh, well, that's interesting. Let's talk about a two-state solution. I wanted to come back to that, actually. Let's talk wait, about it briefly. Wait, but. Ben, um, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu has been very publicly speaking, especially to his own you know, constituents in Israel, about how they should continue to support him because he will guarantee that there won't be no two-state solution. Of course, he's been saying this for a number of years long before October 7th. That's obviously widely out of step with what you and what President Biden are saying are their long-term policy goals. What do you make of that? that yeah. I'm Let sorry. me answer, please. Let me answer. Israel offered the two-state solution in 47, 48, 67, 94, 2000, 2001, 2005, 2007. Israel has repeatedly offered a two-state solution. The Palestinians have said no. I sat down with Abbas in Ramallah, and I said to him, if you say that you would recognize Israel as the nation state of the Jewish people, I will make a phone call right now to my friend Benjamin Netanyahu, and I will get him to agree to a two-state solution. But they have to go first, and they have to say that they recognize the right of Israel to exist as the nation state of the Jewish people. The Palestinians don't want it. They could have had a state repeatedly. They are the worst candidate for support. The Kurds couldn't have ever had a state. The Uyghurs couldn't have ever had a state. The only reason Palestine gets so much support is because they're alleged oppressors of Jews. It is anti-Semitic to the core. The Palestinians are lucky that they are allegedly oppressed by Jews. If they were oppressed by the Syrians, like the Kurds are, or the Iraqis, or the Chinese, like the Uyghurs are, they would get no support at all. You cannot understand the support allegedly for Palestine, although it doesn't support a two-state solution, unless you look deeply into the anti-Semitism that lies behind much of that support. Not there's all of it, but much of it. There's a lot to get into there, and we obviously don't have time to get into it all here. I, I would note that the right of return was a crucial aspect of what Palestinians wanted that was never offered to them, and al along with I, um, the... I, I'm sorry? Right wait, but wait a minute. You, you, you accused me, sir, you, you accused me of filibustering. Right well, Israel has given a right to return to people from the Jewish diaspora who have no personal ties to Israel at all. But I have many other but, but let me, but, let me, Professor Dershowitz. Right, let's see if you get a final word in on this Professor, subject. Professor, I, I haven't even asked my hand. question. I just, I wanted to ask it to wrap it up. You don't ask questions. You express points of view. You should be a guest, not a host. That, that's fine. Well, that's why I'm going to ask you this following question. Um, Norm Finkelstein, has, uh, who is an expert on this, on this issue, has offered to debate you. If, if I could just ask this, Professor Dershowitz. his heart, every part of his heart, to see these murders raped. How dare you cite Norman Finkelstein? He's a bigot, an anti-Semite, and a supporter of Hamas. Isn't he? Okay. Uh, well, no, I, I actually think that he's a, a renowned scholar whose parents uh, survived the Warsaw not Ghetto not and is the foremost authority on what's going on in Gaza. But I wanted to put to you, would you be willing to have a longer form conversation with Norm Finkelstein, either here or in another format of a show, to unpack some of these debates? I already have done that. I did it on the Pierce Morgan show, and um, uh, he just monopolized the, t the whole conversation. 
he went 14 minutes and I was given only eight minutes. Well, I, think I would only I, do it at, yeah. at a talk and the exact amount of time accorded to everyone, then I might do it. But I'm not going to do it with he yeah. getting 14 minutes. I, I agree. I agree that Professor Finkelstein can be a little long-winded. I would be happy to host an unbounded, time-bounded conversation of that type with the two of you, if you were willing. Let me be very clear. You are not a moderator. I will do it with you as an opponent. I will have a debate with you, moderated by the gentleman on the other side. But you are not a moderator. You are I'd be an advocate. I'd be happy to do that as well, uh, prof uh, um, Professor. You consent, you consent, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure we can find someone that's, that's, that satisfies you. All right, we, we will actually work towards setting up a, a fully functioning uh, debate on this subject between the two of you where there's enough time for both to respond and we, we get that actually sounds like a really good idea. I was joking when I said I don't consent to do it. I would happily do it. Um, I, I want to get in one more question on the subject at hand and then we do have to let you let you go. Can you just predict for us whether you think the Supreme Court will take up the Colorado case, how likely it is that we'd hear from them if they're going to do that? Yes, I think they will give a stay in early January set oral argument probably for February and have a decision likely in March. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Dershowitz, for joining us. Uh, we will be in contact with you again to hope to have a longer discussion on the Israel-Palestine issue. Uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you.